Hi, I'm Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage, and welcome to another one of our series in In the Shadow of Industry, um, where we're exploring the sites, industrial sites, around the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And I'm joined by my colleague, Curtis Durham, who will come up here in just a second. And today we're gonna talk about general ship repair. And we've got a little bit of a treat, actually kind of a big, of a big treat, in that uh, we've got a gentleman named Ryan Lynch, who was the fourth generation in the Lynch family um, to own and operate this. He's part of the fourth generation owners and operators, so we're going to hear from him as well. But let's start with general ship repair. It got its start in the 1920s, um, uh, actually across the harbor, um, and has been in the Lynch family for four generations. Um, they had a close call during the Depression um, where due to bankruptcy, uh, it fell out of their family, but only briefly. It went up for public auction, and the high bidder at the auction was none other than members of the Lynch family. So they got their company back. Um, talk about tenacious. I guess maybe if most of your day is spent with a welding torch in your hand in cold, rainy winter uh, weather, uh, repairing the holes and bottoms of the ships, uh, maybe tenacity is just part of your DNA. Um, but General Ship has been repairing ships here in the harbor uh, ever since. Um, and in fact, they are the uh, official ship repair for the Port of Baltimore for their barges and their tugs. And I think that's a good place to start. Let's start with the Port of Baltimore. Um, it was created in 1706, I believe that was the date, uh, by an act of the Maryland General Assembly. And it was created specifically uh, to haul tobacco, uh, ship tobacco, out of the colony of Maryland. That was its express purpose. Um, this was in a day, remember, we were still a colony and, uh, and the British controlled everything, including where tobacco could get shipped out of. Um, it was doing well. Across the harbor, though, was a naturally deeper port called Fells Point. Um, and Fells Point uh, was, had been chugging away building and repairing ships and uh, shipping in the shipping business since the 1680s. So it got a little bit of a start on that. Um, but General, uh, uh, but the Port of Baltimore um, did pretty well. Um, it was aided by at least three different things. The first was dredging. As early as the 1780s, um, we started, the port started dredging here in the harbor. Um, uh, and none other than the Ellicott brothers, if you know of Ellicott City, uh, same family. They apparently were ingenious mill builders, but also ingenious dredge innovators. And with their dredges, the Ellicott Brothers Dredging Company, I believe, um, uh, the port started deepening its channel. The second was lights, and the first lights to aid in navigation, of course, in, in the dark. Um, the first lights were along North Point Ridge um, that helped shipping uh, tremendously. Uh, but then in the 16, uh, I'm sorry, in the 1860s, um, along comes the Hawkins Point Lighthouse and other lighthouses um, out in the water that helped as well. And the third thing is in the 1840s, uh, the port got a real boost with the B&O Railroad laying tracks, railroad tracks here to Locust Point. Um, originally called Whetstone Point. Um, the first uh, owner was a guy named James Carroll um, of the early uh, Maryland family, the Carrolls, uh, uh, if you know them. Um, he consolidated land and uh, thought that the land here on what we call Locust Point today uh, looked like a whetstone, the sharpening tool of the day. That's where it got its name. But in the 1840s, uh, B the B&O ran railroad tracks here, and uh, we were able to ship things that were grown in the interior grain and whatnot in Indiana and Illinois and Ohio come here by train and then out by ship um, as well as uh, get things in from all over the world and ship them all over uh, the still relatively new United States. Um, after the Civil War that train track became important because it was not only goods coming in it was people coming in and Locust Point here became Whetstone Point. Locust Point became um, one of the uh, largest points of entry especially for European immigrants um, second only to Ellis Island in many years. Um, so we've got all sorts of uh, stuff coming and going and the question is well what stuff really came and went uh, from the Port of Baltimore over the years and the answer to that is really everything. When George Washington was president um, in his first term he made shipping with China, trade with China a priority. We were China was second only to Great Britain as a trade partner so coming in through the Port of Baltimore would have been tea of course um, as well as porcelain and silk and other things 
from the Orient. Um, uh, that was what was happening in the early days. Um, by the, uh, say, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, the famous clipper ship, uh, Baltimore clipper ship, that had been the, uh, trafficking so many of those goods um, was on the decline. Um, the steamer was on the way in, and especially after 1904 and the Panama Canal was built, um, it became advantageous to have big ships that could carry a lot, even if they were slower. So we started importing fruit, especially from the United Fruit Company, and especially bananas. Bananas were king. And in fact, uh, bananas were so king uh, that at one point when Baltimore is deciding on what to adopt uh, as an official sort of symbol, we chose between the blue crab and the banana, and the banana almost won. Can you imagine all of those yard signs and flags that instead of having a blue crab on them had, had the word Baltimore and then a big yellow banana? Whew, thankfully, we did not do that. Um, and then finally, uh, by today, uh, bananas are out, although we are still one of, Dole Fruit calls us one of the biggest banana consuming cities in the country. Bananas are out and row, row is in. Roll on, roll off. The Port of Baltimore is one of the largest importers of automobiles um, in the country. And with that, I am gonna turn it over to my colleague, Curtis, uh, to talk a little bit about what's, uh, what's in the Baltimore Museum of Industry. All right, Curtis. Thank you, Johns. And thank you again, PNC, for your generous sponsorship of this video series. If you like ships and ship buildings, boy, do we have a collection for you. At our research center in our archives and library here at the BMI, we have a collection of ship plans spanning over 25,000 plans. These, uh, these plans for, uh, span probably 100 years, from the late 1890s through 1985. Um, some highlights include uh, Liberty Ships and uh, my personal favorite, the Conversion Ships, wherein ships from World War II were converted into both commercial or private use. So hats off to the engineers for figuring that out. Thanks, Curtis. I'm delighted to now turn it over to Ryan Lynch, who again is uh, a member of the Lynch family, one of the fourth generation of Lynches that are currently owning and operating uh, the ship uh, repair company today. All right, Ryan, we're all yours. All right, thanks, John. Um, my name's uh, Ryan Lynch. I'm a fourth generation working here at General Ship Repair. Um, my great grandfather actually started the business uh, in the Inner Harbor uh, where the Hyatt is as a little machine shop working on uh, little schooners coming in, um, you know, wooden vessels back in the day. Um, he later moved the business here to Key Highway and um, lost the business in the Great Depression, was able to buy it back, and we've been in the same location ever since. Um, uh, I've worked here with my, my two uncles uh, who recently retired and my father and my brother works here as well. So um, it's been in the Lynch family for uh, almost a century. Um, we're doing mostly uh, nowadays work on um, tugboats, barges, dinner cruise boats, uh, small Coast Guard ves vessels, um, but also traveling to the port. Uh, to do emergency repairs on, on bigger vessels and the Ready Reserve fleet. Um, as you can see behind me, we have uh, two floating dry docks um, to float the vessels and do underwater repairs. We're actually getting ready to undock this uh, vessel here, uh, Coast Guard Cutter Chalk. And I'm going to wind this up uh, by saying thank you again to General Ship for letting us uh, uh, film on their yard. We're on location here. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.